May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Years ago, I was listening to a family therapist who was doing a radio interview with Terry Gross on Fresh Air out of WHYY in Philadelphia. Terry, in the midst of the conversation, the back and forth, said this to the therapist, you know, the family is a very neurotic institution. And the family therapist paused but responded, that is true, Terry, but it is the best neurotic institution we have. <laughs> I've thought about that often since I heard it. It's true, Terry, but it's the best neurotic institution we have. Yes, it is. Family is neurotic. It's complex. It's complicated. If you don't believe me, then you haven't been listening to the passages of Scripture in Genesis and Matthew today. They are tough texts because they're about neurotic, complicated, and complex families. So let's take a closer look. In Genesis, Abraham was told by God to have a child with Hagar, the servant of his wife, Sarah. So he does. He follows what God says. Hagar gives birth to Ishmael, who arrives to the celebration of Abraham and most people, except Sarah's not quite as happy about it as others because she cannot bear a child. She's barren and she's bitter. When God eventually blesses Sarah, last week's text at age 90, remember that one? He gives Sarah and Abraham a son named Isaac. And Sarah tells Abraham, to drive that woman out of the camp and into the wilderness. The cruel action is supported by God. Nothing like support by God in something like that to back you up, right? Who says in essence to Abraham, don't worry about them in the wilderness, I'll take care of them. The contrast between Ishmael and Isaac, Hagar and Sarah is stunning. Isaac is honored and lifted up as a child of promise. Ishmael is dismissed from the camp, but he's not dismissed from the narrative. He becomes a very important part of the narrative of scripture. Although the wilderness is a place where he barely survives, he does survive, and he becomes the father of the Ishmaelites, who we eventually know as Muslims. Sadly, through time, we have drunk the Kool-Aid of our forebears in faith who have waved the flag of celebration for Isaac and turned our backs most often, listening and failing to hear the voice of Ishmael. They are siblings, and most importantly, both of them are children of Abraham. Each is important. Each becomes a leader of a great nation, as we read in Scripture. The child who leads the Hebrew people, Isaac, and the child who leads the people of Islam, Ishmael, are central to our family tree. Neither should be ignored. Both should be celebrated and blessed. Now, our neurotic family's gospel medicine may be even more difficult to swallow than the stuff you heard from the old text. In Matthew 10, 24 through 39, Jesus turns family values on its head. Jesus is not the focus on the family kind of guy in this text. He's not talking, though, about the ordinary struggles, the cruelties even, in family life, as devastating as they can be. He is talking about divisions that occur in families when he walks into the middle of the family. What happens to family loyalty when you put Jesus first in life? I have seen struggles in families caused by the presence of Jesus in the household of faith that they're in. When do you, or what do you do when one of your family members makes a radical decision to choose another church or perhaps another faith? What do you say to parents when one adult child refuses to go to church while the other leaves the church for her childhood, for a place of her childhood, for a place where they speak in tongues, a Pentecostal church? Now that would be different from our tradition, right? What do you say to a Christian father and mother who are delighted to see their children become doctors and teachers and lawyers and business leaders, and yet when one happens to follow God's call to ministry and seek to be a pastor or a priest, they make a comment like this. 
What is wrong with that child? <laughs> Years ago, I was actually asked that. I was asked by a parent, how did we fail our daughter when she chose to enter the ministry rather than become a doctor? Well, consider that the question was coming to me for a second, okay? Just think about this. I'm right there, right? I'm the one they're asking. Kind of tough to answer as a pastor. You might not believe this, but this was the one moment in my whole life when I was speechless. It actually happened. After pausing for what seemed like an attorney, I finally responded, well, I know how you feel. My parents felt the same way because I went off to college as pre-law and then I found Jesus and I left the legal profession. I left the law for grace. That didn't seem to make them feel any better. <laughs> Jesus tells us that the gospel is inherently divisive. What on earth is he saying? I know we don't like this message. I know I don't like it. He says that we should not be surprised when people fight about the gospel, fight about faith. When we put it in that way, it makes a lot more sense because we've seen that happening for a long, long time, right? In Jeremiah 23, 29, the contentious prophet says this, God's word is like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. Jesus puts it this way, do you think that I have come to bring peace on earth? I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. Well, there's, I, I feel like I've sort of deceived you, Chris and Stephanie, by preaching after you ba had the children baptized, because you might not have answered the same way a few minutes later, right? You sure you wanna raise this kid in this church or these children, right? Please don't take your words back. <laughs> Hold on tight. Tighten your seatbelts. Our ride is about to get even bumpier and somewhat more distressing. Jesus continues, I come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. This on the surface sounds very troubling, but I want you to listen to the clear and present way that Jesus is redefining family. For Jesus, family is not just a matter of whose chromosomes you carry around inside of you, or it's not what you look like or what you sound like. He wasn't concerned about your street address or what prestigious last name you carry. He was concerned about one thing, and one thing only, that you were created in the image of God. What is it that you carry inside of you as God's reflection in this world? That's what he was concerned about. He came from a family which included those who had no address and whose names were forgotten by all but God. His family was made up of a lot of mutts. They were the tax collectors, they were the lepers, they were the Roman centurions. They were scruffy looking men who fished in a sea that really was more like a big lake. They were ladies in robes that were made of gold brocade and they were hordes of sque screaming and squealing children, screaming and squealing children. There were lots of sinners. There were only a few saints in his family. In fact, there was no family tree on the inside of his family Bible because everybody in there was in his family. And as much as his ancestors mattered to him, his was more like a family forest than a family tree. In our marketing and advertising-driven world, this purpose-driven church that pastors and lay people are trained to seek out, we're trained to find like-minded people and similar-looking, homogeneous gatherings of people who we can all bring to church to make the next generation of Christians look just like us. We're told that churches will grow from all of this likeness. And believe me, that's practiced in a lot of mega churches that are growing fast. But I have a real problem with this, and I believe Jesus would have breathed fire in reaction to a market-driven church. That is where our 66-year-old church enters this story. On June 25th, 1957, the Evangelical and Reformed Church, which had a German background, they dropped German in 1934, merged with the Congregational Christian Churches, 
which were mostly English, but had a growing and strong percentage of African Americans in the church. They came together to form the first Protestant denomination ever, which united and didn't divide Christianity. In fact, this was the first time in the growth of, growth of the family tree that it had not split and divided. It was the first time that Christianity itself came together. It was a beautiful moment because all of the other branches had been separating and creating new stems and limbs and all sorts of things through the years, but we said, no, we're coming back together on this day, 66 years ago in Cleveland, Ohio. Branches of Christianity were unified for the first time. In my mind, that is the greatest gift, the most significant gift and accomplishment that this revolutionary church, the United Church of Christ, has given the Christian story. We've brought people together. We committed ourselves to unity over division. Our purpose statement declared that our purpose as a people of faith is to love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. We got that from the best source, Jesus. Our vision statement follows the united, we are united in Christ's love just as the world is for all. We are united around that belief. And the mission statement reads, united in spirit and inspired by God's grace, we welcome all, we love all, we seek justice for all. Now, we have been here for a long time and we've had notable members both before that day in history and since. President John Adams, Abigail Adams, and a ton of revolutionary leaders and heroes and sheroes were in our church. Cotton Mather, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was the first woman ever to preach at First Congregational Church. Dr. Washington Gladden, John Brown, Thomas Edison, President Calvin Coolidge, he didn't have much to say, but he had membership in our church. Thornton Wilder, Theodore Dreiser, Dick Van Dyke, Walt Disney, Hubert Humphrey, Reverend Dr. Andrew Young. Julian Bond, Reverend Dr. William Sloan Coffin, Reverend Dr. Walter Brueggemann, and Reverend Dr. Reinhold and his brother Richard Niebuhr, and their sister Ursula, who is perhaps the greatest theologian of the whole family. Antoinette Brown, who stepped up as the first woman to be ordained in Christian faith. And then we had Paul Tillich, and Donald Hall, and Alex Ross, and William Holden, and Reverend Dr. Joffrey Black, President Barack Obama, who was brought to church by his wife, Michelle, whose name you also know, Oprah Winfrey, the Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright, the Reverend Dr. Otis Moss III, Common, Howard Dean, Bill Moyers, Marilyn Robinson, Leonard Pitts, and hold on to your hats, the man who broke the color barrier in not just baseball, but football, Jackie Robinson and Bill Willis Sr and the list goes on. We have always placed Jesus Christ at the heart of our purpose and vision. We have always believed that Jesus and the cross of Christ unite people, doesn't divide people. We have always believed that Christians grow from Jesus. Once Christians have grown from his light, his life, his love, then his church grows. And clearly to grow in Christ according to him is not about looking the same, it's not about sounding the same. It's not about believing all the same things. It's about taking up your cross and following him. Returning to the text from Matthew 10 for a moment, Barbara Brown Taylor puts it this way. There is good news here for those who have the nerve to hear it. The gospel is not a flashlight, but a fire. It can warm and it can burn. The gospel is not a table knife, but a sword. It can set free and it can divide. The gospel is not pablum. It is powerful stuff, powerful enough to challenge the most sacred human ties. But as frightening as it is, it is never to be feared. The peace of God is worth, if the peace of God is worth anything, it's got to be worth everything to us. And anyone knows that the absence of conflict is not peace. The good news is that Jesus Christ, the one who God has given us, is worth fighting for is someone with enough clout to end all the fighting. And his word is like fire, like a hammer, and it breaks rocks into pieces. So, Malcolm Stephen, 
and Madeline Mary. I hope you feel a little bit more welcome. I know you took all the sermon in, so, uh, <laughs> so I hope you feel no, more welcome to your new family. We may not be the best looking, although I think that's up for grabs now that the two of you are here. And we may not be the best behaving, and we were worse before you showed up. Your behavior is perfect, my friends. And we may not be the best believing, but we're certainly not the most homogenous you may ever encounter. But like you, we belong to Jesus Christ. And like you, we will seek to follow him to the cross and beyond. Remembering his final words in Matthew's passage today, those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. And in the end, Malcolm and Madeline, the words of Jeremiah will comfort us as well as guide us. Lord, for you, I am committed to your cause. So take our hands. Take our hands, Madeline and Malcolm. And while I'm at it, Mark Danke, take our hand. You're part of our family and you will be forever, whether you like it or not. <laughs> and our family will proudly carry the flag of both Isaac and Ishmael. We will honor all the forebearers in faith who have come before us and we will welcome all through our doors for all time. You're always welcome here. Malcolm, Madeline, and Mark, we expect to see all three of you on the road ahead. Remember, we were born to run. So we look forward to the road and running with you. The road's calling us. While others may ask, what on earth is going on? You will know that we're venturing out together and we will live in Christ and he will lead us on our journey and he will guide our family now and always. Amen. <laughs>